Everything we do in life comes down to a series of choices. And never before, anywhere in the world, have there been generations who are bombarded with more information coming at us constantly than those of us who work in today's work world. In fact, my father, my dad, turned 98 years old last week. And when I was with him, thank you. <laughs> when I was with him recently, I was visiting him in the retirement home that he lives in, and we were playing cards. And it's a game we play called Spite and Malice, and we've played it my whole life. But did I mention he's 98? He goes a little slower when it's his turn. So as we were playing cards, I took out my phone because it was very clear that I had a lot of time on my hands. I could check my email. Maybe I could check Twitter and Facebook and see what was going on. Maybe someone was trying to reach me about speaking at an event. And I kept looking at my phone while he was making his move with the cards. And finally he said, put that thing away. And I said, Dad, I've got to keep up. This is the new world. It's connected. And he said, no, this is the same world. When you're with another person, you have to be engaged with that person. Now, he also said that in his day, when he would leave the office, he had a half-hour commute. When he would leave the office, they couldn't text him and say, come back, there's been an emergency. My mother couldn't send him uh, an email saying, honey, could you pick up some milk and some bread at the store on your way home? And the kids, we couldn't contact them and say, Dad, the coach didn't show up. Can you come and coach the team? He had time to think about his day while he was doing his drive home. He had time to contemplate all the information that came at him, and his clients didn't expect him to reply until the next day. But now we have so much information going at us, all we're doing is making choices, making choices, making choices, and we're not paying attention to the other people who are around us. Now, I like to take this down to a very micro level. In the United States, I start my day every day by going to a Starbucks or similar type coffee house. Now, I know that two weeks ago, the first Starbucks opened in Mumbai. So I know some of you will have Starbucks popping up on every corner where you live. But have you ever thought that when you go into one of these coffee houses or a Starbucks and you wait in line and it's your turn to order, when you get up to the counter, have you ever thought that at that moment you have 19,000 beverage choices that you can make? And people say to me, they go, Tom, 19,000 beverage choices? I just want a cup of coffee. But they have four sizes, usually three flavors plus a decaf. They have all the frappuccinos and smoothies that they make in the blenders. They have all the teas that they can brew. But then it gets over to where they make the specialty lattes with all the flavored syrups and all the different types of milk. And you start doing the mathematical equation, and it comes out to over 19,000 choices. And yet every time I go into a Starbucks and I stand in line and it's my turn to order, I order a grande non-fat vanilla latte every single time. And I do this because I know what I'm going to get. I don't want 19,000 choices when I'm getting my coffee in the morning. I want to go with what I know, with what I like, and what I trust. I'm sure the mochas taste really good. I'm sure they have wonderful tea. But I don't want to take the risk, and I don't have time to think about that. So I focus on what I already know. And I think that's what's happening in our careers. I think that's what's happening at our office. We focus on the people we need to deal with, and we want to deal with, and we're used to dealing with, and we ignore everybody else. And I certainly know that's what happens at conferences when people fly across the world to get together. One of the main reasons is to network. But when they get there, they focus on the one thing, the one person who they already know from back home. They sit with their friends, etc. So I want to ask you all to make different choices where people are concerned. Because as my father said, when we're with people, we need to choose. We need to choose to relate to those people who are with us. So I call my talk Connecting with People in a Social Media Crazy World because the world is getting smaller. Peter talked about how intertwined we all are, and as everybody goes to, to the smartphone, everybody will have access to everybody. So the world is getting smaller. But are we really getting closer to each other, or are we putting up more barriers to that human-to-human -human connection? Now, I'm a fan of social media. I think it's great. I use it every day. I am always on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I used to work for a company that used Yammer when it first came out. I think that all of these things are wonderful tools that we use. And in fact, at this conference, if you're using Twitter, you have a chance to win a laptop. 
So there's part of the community. So be sure you're getting on Twitter because you want to win the laptop. And more important, you can see who else is here and who else is part of the community and who back home is watching. They told me that 200 people right now are watching the live feed in India and around the world. So we are closer. But those of us who are here in Macau, we have something special. And that is we have each other. Because nothing replaces, nothing can replace that face-to-face -face conversation. One of the great things about going to a conference like this one is what happens in the hallways. It's those conversations when you hear a speaker say something and you turn to someone else and you ask them what was their opinion. And the two of you start talking spontaneously and the conversation builds and builds. Oftentimes people say that was the most valuable part of the conference. So take advantage of those face-to-face -face conversations. And I speak to people from all over the world, and people tell me that it doesn't matter the culture, it doesn't matter the country, relationships really do matter. That's how things get done. Now, I've written several books. One of my books is called The ABCs of Networking, not computer to computer networking, but again, human to human networking. Now, I could tell you a lot of great things about this book. It's my best selling book, it's the one people like the most. But I'm going to tell you what is the most important thing about this book, and that is in September. It was picked up by a publisher in India, and it is now available in Hindi. So to heck with my other nine books, this is certainly the most important of all of the books. And in the book, in the English version of the book, I go through the alphabet, and every letter represents something that really ties people to get more excited about that human-to-human -human connection. And so every single page in the book talks about you know, A is for attitude, B is for brand, all the way through the alphabet. However, I thought about this audience as I was flying over from Texas, and I thought, what are, I don't have time to go through the whole book, and that's not what you want to hear. What are the four most important letters that I could share with you really quickly? And those letters are D, E, L, L. And in the book, D stands for determination. If you really think that having a bigger network and, and making more connections with other people can help your career and also help your company, you have to be determined that that's something that you're going to take an active role in. So determination is very important to make this successful. The E, the E stands for evangelize. Now in America, an evangelist could be a religious preacher, but it's also someone who states their cause and clearly goes with passion for what it is that they're working on. And so I tell you that if you want to connect with other people, you have to be an evangelist for yourself, for your company, for your employees, and for those around you. The first L stands for leading edge. Because on an airplane, that leading edge of the wing is what cuts through the air. I'm learning to be a private pilot right now, so I'm studying aviotics. That leading edge is what pushes through the air. It's first to go, and that's what creates lift and allows the airplane to fly. When you're leading edge, when it comes to connecting with other people, to leading the way in your company, because some of the younger people, they haven't been taught that this face-to-face, person-to-person relationship stuff matters. They think having a link on LinkedIn is equivalent to a 20-year friendship that you might have with somebody. It's not the same thing. So what you need to do is be leading edge and lead by example and show how you care about the other people who you meet. And Dell is a leading edge company. I happen to have lived in Austin, Texas for the last 24 years, and I have seen, I've never worked for Dell, but I've worked with Dell, and I've been, lived in communities where many of the Dell people live right there in Central Texas, and they have always been a leading edge company from the days of laptops now into the uh, enterprise sector that they are leading the way. And the other L, so there's only one L in the book. I had to come up with another one. The other L stands for legacy. Because at the end of the day, it's what we leave behind in our legacy that we all care about that really matters when it comes to our families and our children, but also to the people who we work with and how we can impact them. That legacy you leave behind is so important. And that's why people matter. Now, a major reason that people say they get on planes and fly to conferences like this is for these networking opportunities. People said it in the video. They were coming to network. And yet, once they arrive, oftentimes people, people kind of don't achieve. They do not achieve what they set out to do. They sit with their coworkers. They sit with their friends. On every break, they're on their phone. 
they're not reaching out to the person next to them and talking. So let's make this conference different. For those of us who are here, let's, let's be innovative and try to meet more people than you've ever met at any other conference like this that you've ever been to in your career. Because networking really does matter. Because all opportunities in life, all of them come from other people. It doesn't matter what opportunity you've had, some other person has been involved with leading you to that, whether it's your job, whether it's who you're married to, whatever that opportunity is, some person has been there along the way. Now, the chair you're sitting in, <coughs> it is a great chair. Nobody's chair has collapsed, but that chair has not sent anybody an opportunity. Take a minute to look around the room. Just look around at a few of the people sitting at your table. Everybody here has at one point sent an opportunity to someone else and everybody has received an opportunity from someone else. And your career depends on it. In IT, having a big connection of, to people really helps you do your job. Every time I speak with CIOs, the larger their network, the sooner they can solve a problem because somebody they know has already been through that problem. And it helps you find new opportunities for your jobs, for your career, but also for your company. Having that network can bring together can bring together multiple companies. Very often people meet at conferences like this and their companies start doing business together because they started that relationship. Whoops. So the future success for you or your company could be with someone else who is in this room right now. Right now, someone in this room could hold the key to your success and that always opens up a world of possibilities. Now, in our companies that we all work for, we always are looking for ways to have innovation. We always want to innovate in business. We want to be that leading edge. We want to find new ways to do things. We want to transform our companies. So why can't we utilize innovative ways to connect with people? Instead of sticking to the way we've always done things, hoping that someone might introduce us, maybe doing a quick handshake and a little bit of chit chat, why can't we do things that lead us to better connectivity with other people and be innovative about it. Make yourself approachable. Don't just stand there looking away during the breaks. Stand there and look for other people who aren't engaged in conversations and walk up. Join tables of people and start a conversation with them during the breaks. Sit with strangers at lunch. These little things that you actively go and do, people come up to me afterwards and they say, it's so simple, but I sat down with a group of strangers and I said, the guy on stage says I'm supposed to sit with strangers. And all of a sudden a conversation erupted like one I've never had at a luncheon before. Something so simple can go so far. So seek to learn something new from every person you meet because everybody in this room has a vast array of experiences. And when we get past the hello, where are you from, what do you do? And we start learning about those experiences when we start sharing knowledge with each other, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the power that comes out of the three days in Macau can become much, much larger. So it starts with something very simple. It starts with a simple word that in English is just hello. But a friend of mine recently saw me speak at a conference in the United States, and he was born in India, and he came up and he said, it's not just hello. Because he said in America, hello, he goes, Americans greet each other, it's so blah. Hey, hello, yo, dude. He said that in India, the term would be namaste. And he told me, and I, please forgive me for the loose interpretation of what he told me, it was, I see you, and I recognize what is inside of you. That might be a little off of, of the exact interpretation, but when he said that, I said to myself, wow, that is really powerful. I wish every time we greeted somebody, in any country, in any situation, we actually said, I see you and I recognize what's inside you. Because when we do that, it goes so far. It really does make a difference. So I call it the power of hello and it is going with a big greeting. But it's not just, and I'll explain big in a second, it's not just talking about yourself. In America, companies spend a lot of money teaching people about an elevator statement or an elevator pitch. And I don't know if you, if you have this, but the idea is, is that you memorize three or four or five sentences about yourself so that when you meet somebody, you can quickly and clearly tell them all about you. 
but that sends the wrong message because it tells people that networking is tell them everything about you as quick as you can. It's as if we were on an elevator together on the 34th floor and I got on and flicked a switch in my back and looked right at you and just said, hi, my name's Tom Singer, I speak at conferences, I've written 10 books, blah, 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 I just throw up all over you. When that elevator got down to the lobby and the doors opened, what would you want to do? You would want to run. You'd want to get away from somebody who starts just talking about themselves. So when you meet somebody, it's not just reciting who you are and what you do. It's finding out about them. And I call it a big greeting because you want to find out their background. You want to learn a little bit about their interests and then a little bit about their goals. So in the case of, of the conference, find out where they're from, what company they work for, where they went to school, how large is their operation that they run in IT. Find out their interests. What do they like to do when they're not running their IT department? And then finally, a real simple goal is, what do you hope to accomplish while you're here in Macau for the next three days? Because when someone tells you their purpose for being here, that might be a little different than your purpose. And all of a sudden, it can open up a whole new purpose for you. So I do a thing called the power of hello at a conference, and we're going to do this in just a second. It's very quick. It is not painful. I'm going to ask each of you to stand up in just a second and find someone who you've never met before in the room and just ask them where they're from, where they work, a little bit about their background. We're just going to do two minutes. This is not going to be a prolonged thing. Then they're going to ask you the same questions. And watch what happens. If you'll play with me for just a second and stand up and find somebody who you've never met before and just talk with them. I'm going to show you something when we sit down. Now, I've done this with rooms of 3,000 executives, and they sit down very fast when I say, sit back down. So with 200 people, when I say, sit back down, I hope you'll return to your seats very quickly. So on the count of three, get up, find someone you've never met, and have a very quick but conversation about where they're from, et cetera. Ready, set, go. One, two, three, go. Okay, you can take your seat again. Thank, thank the person you're talking to and return to your seat. The fascinating thing is, is whenever I speak to small audiences or large audiences, when people get up and say hello and start asking questions and talking to the other person, you can feel the energy level in the room slowly go from quiet to build, and the energy level gets higher and higher. You only had two and a half to three minutes. And yet the energy level kept slowly rising the more you started talking to another person. The more you engaged with that person and found out about them and told them about you, I could feel the, the volume go up in the room and I could feel that energy level go up and it starts to bounce off the ceiling and it all starts with something so simple as just starting a conversation with another person. So it really is something so simple when you really get that power of hello, when you really get that that background, that information, that goals, the energy level starts going crazy. But the weird thing is that person who you've never met before is going to show up for the next three days all over the place. You'll go to the casino later tonight and you'll look across the table and that person will be sitting there. Or tomorrow morning you'll wake up early and go to the gym and that person will be on the treadmill next to you. I don't know what it is, but once we have started to have a conversation with somebody, they become part of our field of vision and they show up. Because meeting someone one time does not make them part of your network. Meeting someone one time makes them someone who you have met one time. And there is a big difference between someone you have met once and someone with whom you, who you've established a long-term and mutually beneficial relationship with understanding. Now, when you create that type of a relationship, that's where huge things can happen. But it has to start somewhere. So you've said hello, you've met somebody. Now, as you walk down the halls, they're going to be there. You're going to be like, where did you come from? Everywhere I turn around, that person is there again. So have fun with this. Because every time you start a conversation, it doesn't mean that person's going to become your best friend, that they're going to hire you for a new job. It just means that they have now crossed your path and you're now part of each other's world. And extend those conversations each time you see them and maybe a true friendship will grow out of this. And so don't spend your breaks buried in your phone. Spend your breaks face to face choosing, choosing other people. Whoops. Because meeting people is interesting. People are fascinating. It doesn't matter where someone comes from or, 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 or where they work or what industry they're in. Because I talk to tech, I talk to lawyers, I talk to doctors, I talk to accountants. It doesn't matter what the background is. People are fascinating when you get past that idle hello 
sort of thing. So I challenge you, at every break that we have, at every meal, at every event over the next two days, try to meet at least one person you've never met before and have a meaningful conversation because it really does matter and it really will impact your business. But as I leave you, I have to remind you that this isn't just about business. Because when you meet somebody new, when you have a conversation with a person, on the other side of that conversation, there's a human being. And we all have, we all have our own stuff going on in our lives beyond just what we do at work. And some of that stuff is good. People get promoted, they get married, they have children, maybe they have grandchildren. Exciting things happen in their life. When someone who is one of your business friends has something good happen, celebrate. Send them an email, call them, and tell them, congratulations, I'm happy for you. Share in the good experiences that happen to other people. Because it's those shared experiences where we build these types of friendships I'm talking about. However, sometimes... Sometimes bad things happen to really good people. And I'm not talking about your best friend, your brother, your parents, people you, you know very well. I'm talking about the world, just your business friends. Sometimes those people go through hard times. Their company goes out of business. Uh, maybe they're dealing with aging parents. Maybe something happens to their spouse, or worse, something happens to one of their kids. We don't know what to say. So oftentimes we never say anything. We see them at work or at an event, and we know they're going through a rough time, and we don't know what to say, so we don't say anything. And I know this firsthand. Because when my youngest daughter was born, she's 10 years old now and she is fabulous, but when she was born, she was born with a medical condition where the bones in her head had fused together before she was born, and they didn't diagnose it. So as she was growing as a baby, her head couldn't grow like a normal head. So it started to deform and grow this way. And we kept asking the doctor, and he said, heads are funny, it'll round out. And when she was four months old, he sent us for a CAT scan. And he told us, don't worry, I'm sure she doesn't have this thing where the bones fuse together. The doctor assured us that it would not come back positive. And 80% of the kids who have this problem called sagittal synostosis, 80% of them are boys. So there was no way Kate was going to have this problem. Well, my daughter likes to buck the odds, and always has, and it came back positive. And this was not a happy time. We didn't know what to do. We had two choices. We could raise a kid who would have a seriously limiting handicap, maybe some brain damage, or we could do surgery where they would remove the entire top of her skull before she turned six months old. Neither was a great option. My wife cried herself to sleep every night for a month. And yet I had to go to work. I had a high profile job in Austin. The company I worked for hosted large events. I often was the MC, or I worked the door to check people in or we would sponsor things and I'd have to be there at the booth. And everyone in my community knew what was going on because people talked, people knew. And I don't fault them for not saying anything but most people would look at me and they were my friends but they didn't know what to say so they said nothing. But there were some other people. There were some other people I'll never forget, and some of them I barely knew. They would see me from across the room, and they'd walk over, and they'd shake my hand, and they would say things like, I know what you're going through, and I'm sorry. I'm thinking about her. People from different religions all over the world prayed for her. People said things like, can I give you some free tickets on, on the airlines because I know you're talking to doctors all over the country? They would say things like, I never use my free tickets. Everybody uses their free tickets. But this was their way of saying, I see you and I want to help you. And then one night when this was all going on, after several months, we got a phone call at 1.30 in the morning. The phone rang and rang and rang. We don't have a phone in our bedroom. So after about the 10th time, I ran down the stairs. I answered the phone. It was someone in my network, someone I, who I had met through an organization, through an association. And he, said, he identified himself, and it was 1.30 in the morning, and I'm like, what? And he said, I just got off the phone with my first cousin. So? His first cousin was one of the top five pediatric neurosurgeons in the world, and he had invented a new way to do the surgery to separate the bones where they wouldn't have to be as invasive with the child. She wouldn't have to be in the hospital for two weeks. She wouldn't have to have three full body blood transfusions. Instead, she'd be in the hospital for a few days. He would go in through small cuts. 
I'd read about this doctor. You couldn't get in to see him because he was so popular. Anybody with any type of cranial issue on an infant came from around the world to San Diego. You couldn't get in to see him. And my friend said, he's expecting your call at noon tomorrow. The next day I called this doctor. His assistant put him through. I talked to him for an hour and a half. He told me about the new surgery. And I asked him, I said, doctor, how many times have you done this new surgery? And he said, 13. God, I wanted him to say 492. I didn't feel comfortable, but he said, let me see Kate. So my wife and Kate flew from Texas to San Diego the next day. That night she called me and said, get Jackie, our older child, and get out here. He wants to do the surgery on Friday. Four to four or five days after finding out that this doctor was connected to someone I knew, Kate was in surgery in San Diego for three hours where they reconstructed her whole skull. And today she is fabulous. She is 10 years old. Thank you. She is 10 years old. She's in the fifth grade. She's reading at a seventh grade level. Her bones all grew back. It's really solid. You can walk up to her and go like that. Don't, but you could. It's all bone. I don't know what the odds are any one of you would ever need a pediatric neurosurgeon. I imagine that's very small. But something you need in your career, someone in your network's first cousin might have the answer. And that's why choosing people matters, because it's not just about business. It's not just about business, because when you have real connections with real people, those people will go out of their way to help you achieve whatever you need. So today, I know I'm very fortunate because Kate is fabulous. I'm sure another doctor would have done a great job. But because of my network, because of people I had met, because of reaching out and opening up about what was going on with me, I got connected to the one thing I've needed more than anything else in the world, and that was this doctor in San Diego. So I challenge you to notice people, to see people, to listen to people, and to learn about them and let them learn about you because people matter. And that's why in this world where we can connect to everybody in a digital way like that, it still comes down to that face-to-face, human-to-human interaction because people matter in our social media crazy world. Thank you very much. I'm going to be around for the next three days. I'll take the stage a couple of more times. I want you to come and tell me the stories of who you met and the conversations you've had because it's the stories that you tell me when you meet someone and find that connection that really make this whole process work for the next three days. So I look forward to talking to you, as many of you as I can. Thank you.